So I decided to very intentionally set aside my religious upbringing and embark on a search for truth. I decided, um, I guess it's up to me. Welcome back to the All of Life show. I am your host, Stuart White, along with my beautiful, lovely, amazing, talented, incredible... Did I mention beautiful? Oh, babe, you're the best. I'm Alicia White, your co-host of the All of Life show. Happy to be here. Babe, we have had uh, quite an adventurous last few months. We went a few places. We did. We went... I'm trying to remember because we've been quite a few places, but I know we went to Maui for sure. Um, we went to Disney World before that. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we we came back from Maui and had a few days at home. Then we went camping, and I it think, just sounds like we're just all adventure all the time. Well, then we just we went camping again, but I know we went somewhere else in between. Oh, we went to Nashville. Oh yeah, we went to Nashville. <laughs> we went to Nashville. Yeah, that we've was been it. all over the place. Honestly, this is what I think happened. I think that um, the last year and a half had everyone so cooped up that we literally we're like, no, we're not doing it. I think after two weeks, we were like, we are going to, we are going to make this year a year to remember, which has turned into a year and a half because we have traveled all over the place. Yeah. Um, and we're super thankful that we have, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. So here we are. Uh, we have two new episodes that are going to air, uh, right now obviously this one and then next week we're going to have a a second part of this episode and who are we interviewing on this episode babe we are interviewing on this episode and next week's episode an author and apologist named nancy piercy she is a brilliant brilliant mind i loved every minute of this interview well these two interviews i should say Yeah, Nancy has written books such as Total Truth and Love Thy Body, and in this episode, we're going to be talking to her about Total Truth. Now, for those of you who may not have even heard of this book, you definitely need to. There will be links in the show notes to everything you need to know. I just can't emphasize enough how much this book has meant to us and um, how much her other work has meant to us. All I can say is I'm excited for this episode. I really hope that you guys get a lot out of it, and I hope you are just eager to listen to the part two, uh, which we will be releasing next week. I think uh, my favorite thing about this particular episode was that, and we've said this on the show before, but there is a um, <laughs> there is a true pandemic right now in our culture, and that is uh, a lack of searching for actual truth, a lack of, or just an acceptance that um, truth can be anything that you want it to be, which if you guys have been listening to the podcast for very long at all, you will know that we completely disagree with that statement. We do believe that there can be total truth. So if you want to know more about that, hang on tight, listen to this episode. You're really going to enjoy it. Yeah. Without further ado, here's our interview with Nancy Piercy. Nancy, welcome to the show. We are very glad to have you today. Thank you. It's good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Well, it is a pleasure. And um, this has been an interview, one that we have been looking forward to for months now. And so, so excited to have you. And for those who are unaware of who you are and your work, give us give us your story. Um, you know, thank you for asking that, because I love to tell my conversion story. <laughs> I'm so grateful to God for my conversion that I, I love to tell this. Um, I, so I was raised in a Lutheran home, and um, it was a uh, very ethnic Lutheran. My parents were both Scandinavian, and I don't know if you know this, but uh, it's like it's like it's like all Irish are Catholic. <laughs> um, parents tend to rely on, on the ethnicity to hold their kids. So when I was in high school, I was attending a public high school. All my teachers are secular. All my textbooks are secular. And I started asking, how do we know Christianity is true? That was it. (laughs) I didn't have a lot of questions, just one. How do we know Christianity is true? It seemed like everyone else that I knew personally was not a Christian. So it seemed a bit presumptuous for us to, well, we've got the truth and you don't. My parents, my pastor, everyone I talked to, had no answers. Uh, apologetics was just not very widespread, uh, I, I guess, especially in the Lutheran church. Um, 
And so I talked to a Christian university professor and I asked him point blank, why are you a Christian? And he said, works for me. <laughs> I said, that's it? That was it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not working for me anymore. <laughs> Uh, and I had a chance to talk to a oh uh, a Lutheran seminary dean, and I thought I would get a more substantial answer from him. And all he said was, "Don't worry, we all have doubts sometimes." Wow. And I thought, you know, you're treating it like a psychological phase that I'm going to outgrow. And so event eventually, I decided that Christianity must not really have any answers. And uh, this was about halfway through high school. So I decided to very intentionally set aside my religious upbringing and embark on a search for truth. I decided, um, I guess it's up to me. And I literally started walking down the hallway in the public high school I attended and pulling books off the philosophy shelf because I thought if I can't get any adults to talk to me about these issues, maybe these, maybe these dead guys can help me because after all, isn't that what philosophy is about? Philosophy is about asking questions like, what is truth? How do we know it? Is there a foundation for ethics or is it just, you know, true for me, true for you? And I have pretty quickly realized that if there was no God, the answer to all of those questions was no, there is no meaning to life. There is no foundation for ethics. Um, we're, we're, adrift, we're adrift on a planet flying through empty space and that's it. You know, life is, a, life is, a, um, is an accident, a cosmic accident happened by by pure chance and so i very quickly went into moral relativism and even skepticism because i thought uh, this is literally how i thought um as a as a high school senior um if all i have is my puny brain and the vast scope of time and space and history is there any chance that i could have access to absolute universal eternal truth it, ridiculous. It seemed to me obviously ridiculous. Um, and I, I, I remember still in um, English class doodling on the side of my homework uh, an image of, of myself with the whole universe as a thought bubble in my own head. <laughs> so I had, I had gone pretty far, like I said, into relativism and skepticism. And it was a few, few years later that I was uh, I was in Germany. We had lived in Germany when I was a kid. So when I graduated from high school, I went back. And I ended up at Labrie, the ministry of Francis Schaeffer, which is in Switzerland. And that was my first exposure to Christian apologetics. I had no idea that Christianity could be supported with good reasons and evidence and arguments and logic. <laughs> And in fact, uh, in fact, I was so impressed that I left, <laughs> which sounds a little odd, but <laughs> I was so impressed that I was afraid I might be drawn in emotionally because Libri was so attractive. You know, these thoughtful Christians, these intellectually engaged Christians, these, and, and culturally engaged too. As you probably know, Schaefer was known for um, encouraging Christians to go into the arts. And in Germany, I was studying violin at the Heidelberg Conservatory. So his, his appreciation of the arts, and I would ask, add one more thing. All the students there, this was 1971, all the students there were hippies. <laughs> and at that time, the hippies were the cool kids. And so I was really astonished that Christians were able to reach out to these disaffected young people. And I thought, who are these Christians? I have never met anyone like this before. But I stayed only a month and then I left. And uh, uh, having discovered apologetics through Libri, I then, I, that's when I found out about Lewis, for example, C.S. Lewis and Chesterton. And I think Os Guinness, Os Guinness had written his first book by then and so on. And so eventually I decided I was intellectually convinced. You see, Christianity had let me down already once before. So I was not going to go back unless I was intellectually convinced it was true. And eventually I had to admit that I, I had reached that level of intellectual conviction. But then, and I did convert, but then I had to say, well, now that I'm a Christian, where do I find other Christians? I was not involved in a church or anything. This was strictly on my own. A friend of mine once said, I read my way back to God. And that, that would be a good way to describe my own journey. I read my way back to God. So I thought, well, I knew some Christians back at Libri. So I got on a plane and went, went back to Libri a year and a half later. So that's when I really got grounded in Christian worldview uh, and really understanding how Christianity applies to all of life. Um, so that's, that's why, and that's why, as you asked, um, why I'm so 
passionate about apologetics because it was such a big part of my conversion. I had to really understand how Christianity is true on an intellectual level before I would entrust myself on a more emotional level to a relationship with God. That's so interesting. And as you were talking there, it reminded me of something common uh, thing, I guess we would share is I would say I went through the same thing somewhere in my teens. I, I want to say somewhere between like 14 and 16, something like that. And and I just remember having this like, yeah, what is the meaning of life? Wait, something has to explain this. And I was raised in a Christian home and, and thinking, okay, somehow it has to have something to do with God. Like it, Now it sounds so funny to say that, but, but at the time you're like, well, I, I really thought that it was just like there was there was faith and that was something you had that was separate. But I remember somehow uh, we, we were homeschooled and my parents had gotten a book from, um, I think it was a homeschool convention and it was Francis Schaeffer, Escape from Reason. And my 14 year old self or so sat down and read this. I probably didn't even understand half of it because it's so brilliant. And like, I didn't know what he was referring to when he's talking about all these ages of art and, and culture and different things, but it made a lot of sense. And, and I was like, oh, wow, there's, there's actually intelligent people out there who believe this. And it isn't just a, a, like a, something where it's like you were told, oh, don't worry, we all have doubts. It's like, no, it's not, it's not just a doubt thing. It's like, I actually want proof. And so for me, that, that was something that was like very shaping was like, oh, there, there's actually foundational truth in all of this. Um, and so th that brings us to, to total truth, I think. You, in your writing, there's a very clear theme uh, and conviction to everything that you, you write about. And it seems all to just trace back to this uh, Jesus and gospel. And if God is true and all of that is real, then there, there must be something uh, fundamentally related to everything that we do. Yeah, one of Schaefer's major themes was that the concept of truth has been divided. You know, most civilizations have known that there's a, a natural order and a moral order, uh, a spiritual moral order. And so, and they, but they thought that the two were intertwined. They were connected. And therefore, truth would also be an integrated, consistent, coherent system. But with the rise of modern science, uh, Western thinkers began to say, no, no, the only uh, reliable knowledge we have is of science, empirical facts, what can be scientifically tested. And what does that mean then for theological and moral truths? Well, they said they're not really truths. They're just a matter of personal preference, you know, what you, the behavior you approve or disapprove, you know, what you like or don't like. And so that split, that split, in a sense, uh, the concept of truth was split apart into two separate domains. And that permeated all of Francis Schaeffer's writings. Um, and, and it permeates all of my writings, by the way, uh, because it turned out to be so foundational. He was so right. He used to say, you will not be able to talk to young people about you know, that Christianity is true if you don't recognize that they have absorbed a different view of truth. Let me personalize this. You know, as I said, when I arrived at Labrie, I was already such a relativist and skeptic that I had to go through a two-step process. I had to first be convinced that Christianity, that, excuse me, I had to first be convinced that there was such a thing as objective truth before I could even consider whether Christianity was that truth. Uh, Schaefer used to call that pre-evangelism. He said that mm. some, with some people, there are many steps that you have to go through before you can even get to the gospel. And, and that was the case with me as well. That was 1970s. You know, it's even more the case today that young people have this split view of truth where they think science and reason and facts, um, to, to use, uh, I, should, I should, so you can uh, conceptualize this, get a picture in your mind. Uh, Schaefer used to use the imagery of two stories in a building to illustrate the split view of truth. He said, in the lower story is science, reason, and facts. And in the upper story then, it's like people sort of threw up into the attic the things that could not be scientifically proven. So God and spirit and our moral sense and meaning and beauty and the arts, all of these things that cannot be stuffed into a test tube and studied under a microscope became then merely relative, private, subjective preferences. And so for many people, if you, if you just come to them with a gospel message, 
they will automatically, unreflexively, throw your message into the upper story, where it's just a matter of your personal preference. And they're, they're likely to say, I'm glad that works for you. <laughs> I'm glad that works for you. But they feel no sense that, no, no, you're commuting, you're communicating an objective truth that is true for everyone, everywhere, at all times. They just don't even hear that message anymore. Do you, it, it almost seems like there's a, I, I mean, I, I genuinely believe this. There is a spiritual element behind it. Like, I think that if you think that uh, Satan and demons are real and all of that, that he has uh, nefarious plans for everything, to take away the very basis of there being truth in the first place, it's like now I can't even, like you're saying, you have to have that pre-evangelism where you establish there is truth just to get them to the point, okay, now that we've <laughs> agreed that there is truth, let me tell you about the the truth, you know, the way, the truth, and the life. That is, I, I, I run into that a lot where, or, or you end up with the people who, as you share it with them, it's kind of that pat on the head, like, yeah, that's great. You know, it's all it's all uh, relative and, and subjective. So sure, if that works for you, and I, well, meanwhile, I'm over here and I'm gonna worship Buddha or something else because it's like it, it's up to your own private, you know, upper level interpretation. Yes, and it's also the way that Christianity is um, blocked from having an impact in the public square. Um, I have, I have some examples here. Before the Supreme Court decision passed the Obergefell decision, which made same-sex marriage uh, the law of the land, it had already been debated in several states. And so let me give you a couple of quotes on this. When the, when the Iowa Supreme Court imposed same-sex marriage on that state, which was in 2009, it claimed that the pro-homosexual side, quote, presented an abundance of evidence and research, but the definition of marriage as a man and a woman was, quote, unsupported by reliable scientific studies. In fact, the court said it was nothing but, quote, stereotype and prejudice. In other words, the view of uh, marriage as a man and a woman was primarily a moral and religious view, and therefore they threw it out of the court as stereotype and prejudice. And the same strategy was used when a federal court overturned California's Proposition 8, which had defined marriage as a man and a woman. Here was uh, the, the judge was named uh, Walker. Judge Walker claimed that the pro-homosexual side presented, quote, overwhelming evidence. By contrast, Walker said supporters of Proposition 8 expressed merely, quote, private values, which he rejected as, quote, irrational. So what went back in both cases? You know, if you define one side as scientific and the other side as irrational stereotype and prejudice, who's going to win? So this has now become the main strategy in the secularist playbook. You see, for secular thinkers, uh, the term, you know, per va values, if you say, well, we're, we're promoting Christian values, for the secular person, values means literally whatever some person values, whatever some group of people values. It's a it's a verb. And There's now it no comes from the verb. No necessary truth in that at all, huh? <laughs> no, no, no. It's just what, what basically it's your private tastes and preferences, what you approve, what you like or dislike. And so Judge Walker actually went on to say, supporters of Proposition 8 acted out of nothing more than sheer dislike, quote, dislike of same-sex couples. Or the word he also used was animus against them. Animus means hostility or hatred. So these liberal judges could not even conceive of morality as an objective truth. It was just a matter of emotions. And so this is the main way in which Christianity now is locked out of the public square and um, you know, disempowered. That's another reason Christians need to understand it. It's not only a matter of uh, communicating Christian truth on a personal level, it is also the main strategies tra strategies used on a public level. It it would seem like like you just described. Christians are being held hostage in this uh, this dynamic here of feeling like they're they're in this box and they've been framed into that category, and so they don't even know how to approach anybody anymore. Like, how do we engage and how do we how do we navigate that? How do we fight against this this being put in a box and being isolated away from where the actual conversation is happening? 
Well, yeah, that's a good question. Um, let me give you an example that will show the contrast. You know, Christians need to learn how to assert Christian truth as objective truth. And um, one of the examples I give in my, in my book, Total Truth, is uh, a Star Trek episode. It's called Star Trek The Next Generation. And the plot centers on one character, uh, uh, whether one character is the Klingon Messiah, who has returned from death in fulfillment of prophecy. Do you kind of get the pattern here? <laughs> Um, and the Enterprise's Klingon security officer has to decide whether or not the resurrected Messiah is real. So somebody, another character, challenges him and says, what empirical evidence is there for the truth of these claims? And the security officer answers, well, it's, and this is a direct quote, it's not an empirical matter. It's a matter of faith. You have to take a leap of faith. So what is Star Trek teaching people here? This is not just entertainment. Star Trek is teaching that faith is intrinsically contrary to evidence, that faith is blind and irrational. But if you would talk to a Christian about uh, the evidence for Jesus' claim to be the resurrected Messiah, they would start talking about the, histor the historical evidence for the resurrection, the reliability of eyewitness testimony in the New Testament. They would talk about references to Jesus in sources outside the Bible, like the Roman historian Tacitus or the Jewish historian Josephus. They would talk about the remarkably high quality of the New Testament as, as, as purely historical documents. For example, how close in time they are to the original events. So there was not enough time for a legendary material to be added, and so on. You know, we accept Plato and Aristotle as historical, but their, you know, the, the closest uh, documents we have are more than a thousand years after they lived. Whereas in the case of Jesus, it's like 200, 100 years after Jesus lived, um, depending on the exact dating. So Christianity rests on historical objective evidence. So divided. We don't say there's a lower story truth and an upper story truth. Christianity challenges that division altogether, and it says Christianity is true on all levels. It's truth, we Christians are the only ones today who are really insisting that truth is not divided, that truth is unitary, consistent, holistic, applying to all of life. So, Nancy, where do you think that conversation starts? We're talking about Christians feeling like the conversa conversation is hijacked, and we're, um, when we have these conversations, we're starting from a place of already feeling put into a box. How do we, uh, which I do think that, that Christianity and Christians have kind of um, unintentionally per perpetuated that because we're not educated in apologetics as a Christian culture right now. We have kind of taken more of the um, standpoint of, well, it just takes faith, or we all have doubting experiences sometimes, just believe it. And we're, we're fine with that because it's easy to just say that rather than actually do the work and in educating ourselves in apologetics. And so when we're having a conversation with someone, and you reference this in Total Truth and your other book, Love Thy Body as well, which we're going to get to, but um, you talk about, a, like, basically it all starts back with your worldview. So if, when we want to have culture, cultural conversations from an opposing view with a friend, do we do we always have to bring it back to what your worldview is? Does that always have to be where the conversation starts? Well, if it doesn't start there, it needs to get there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> in a conversation, you, you start with where the person is. Yeah. But you need to get there. And you're absolutely right. Um, by the way, when Schaefer used the imagery of two stories in a building, um, it turned out that he was, uh, he didn't use the language, but in, he was actually mirror, mirroring, reflecting what the secular world is called the fact value split. And facts, with facts in the lower story, you know, and personal values in the upper story. And in total truth, because Schaefer didn't use that language, people were not making the connection. And so in total truth, I made that connection. And all of a sudden people said, oh, oh, that's what he was yeah. talking about. Because many people were familiar with the fact value split and that in secular thought, they do think that values, you know, that, that, excuse me, that's, that facts are empirically knowable and objective, and everybody has to bow to them. You know, whatever science says, we must bow to it. And that values are merely uh, personal preferences and so on. 
And so, uh, so just to give you the language to talk about it with non-Christians, um, they, they tend to call it the fact value split. What, but, but you are absolutely right. Christians have a split as well. What do we call it? We call it the sacred secular split. Mm -hmm. And to, in, in many ways, it mirrors the secular world because what it says is that religious truths apply only to an upper story, to use that metaphor as two stories in a building. Religious truths apply only in an upper story of worship, Bible studies, prayer, and so on and does not really apply, Christian truth does not really apply to the so-called secular realm of, of uh, business, politics, art, education, and so on. And so many people have been so trained in this that even if they want to apply Christian truth to their job, to their vocation, to their professional life, they don't know how. And so this is what we're up against is that even Christians don't typically know how to speak about Christian truth in a way that applies to the secular realm. And so we have to start, for Christians really need to start with themselves. You know, they need to try, try to discern whether they themselves hold a sacred secular split. Uh, you know, let me give you one example just because <laughs> it's from my personal life. Um, my, my son had a kind of conversion experience. Um, he'd never really given up his Christianity, but he hadn't made it his own, right? So, um, I think like he was about 20 when he had an experience and really made it his own and decided to work at a Christian bookstore because he thought this way I will have an opportunity. We're better to work. <laughs> I know, isn't that great? <laughs> um, I'll have an opportunity to be in touch with you know great Christian literature. Um, so at Christmas time, the bookstore decided to have a raffle, a typical fundraising device, right? That people, customers would come in and put their name in a bowl. And then on the big day right before Christmas, they, the staff gathered around the bowl and pulled out a name and tossed it. It turned out they wanted to use the raffle to reward one of their loyal customers. So they kept going through the names until they found the name of somebody that they liked and declared that person the winner. And I thought, I thought, what are these Christians, but have they really thought about the way Christianity applies to their business practices. You have, yeah. Do they really think cheating is appropriate behavior for those who claim to be disciples of Jesus? So, when I've, I've talked to secular businessmen, by the way, excuse me, Christian, Christian businessmen, and the way that they sometimes phrase it is, in business you have to play by a different set of rules. That's how they put mm. it. You have to play by a different set of rules. You have to basically accommodate to the secular world. So that would be an example where um, my son got a really vivid example of uh, the sacred secular split where, you know, they were selling Christian books, but they were using business practices that were not Christian. That were, so they, they, they had absorbed their business practices from the lowest story, from the secular world, even as they had, you know, a very Christian commitment in their, in their heart. Shifting to the question of, so as we're engaging the world, uh, something right now that has become very popular, um, I think guys like Ben Shapiro and others have said it, and I think, I, I swear I heard Francis Schaeffer say it, uh, but is the saying that politics is downstream from culture. And I think something that Christians get hung up in is we are going to change the world. And the way we do that is is through politics. You know, we, we pass good laws. and And I do believe that we have a role in that. But the point of that saying is really, if you want to impact politics, start upstream in culture. But then I, I got to thinking about it and I'm like, well, what is upstream from culture? Like, what is truly the thing that you need to change to make a culture different? And um, my thought was, it's, it's the heart, it's the, the person, and it's the faith that is affecting them and, and where they're placing that. Uh, if it's in if it's in Christ, then that's shaping them. If it's in anything other than him, then that is shaping them too, just in a negative sense, usually. What, what would you say to that, though? Is there, is there something more? Is there anything we're leaving out in that, um, that analogy? Well, I do agree with you. Um, when I wrote Total Truth, and when I wrote my earlier book with Chuck Colson, uh, How Now Shall We Live? We did have some people criticize us for, for treating um, the realm of ideas as important. <laughs> um, and I, I started saying, yes, we're doing unabashed intellectual history. That's what we're doing. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, 
because there are people, uh, sociologists and others, who think ideas follow from, um, the, basically Marxist, right? Marxism says your ideas follow from your economic situation. And so there are even, you know, the, his, basically, if you want to understand his lower upper story, his lower story is economics, and everything else dr is driven by economics. Your uh, society's laws, its religion, its morality, its government, everything is just driven by the economic conditions. Um, and unfortunately, we ran into Christians who basically held the same position. And so we had to actually argue that no, ideas have consequences. You know that book, Ideas Have, there's a book by that title, mm -hmm. Ideas Have Consequences. Uh, so I, I do agree with you that um, ultimately it's a matter of worldviews. That pe of course we're whole, holistic beings. God made us with um, with bodies, so we're physical. God made us social beings, so our social environment matters. All of this matters, but I do think that we have a realm of freedom in our minds where we can, in fact, decide what we think is is true. And that's why we have conversions. If we were totally determined by our economic and social environment, no one could ever convert to Christianity. We'd be totally determined by social and economic forces. So I think it's clear that as Christians, we have to claim that there's a realm uh, in, the inner, in the inner person, when you call that intellectual, when you call it um, the, the spiritual realm, whatever you want to call it, there is an inner part of the human being that can be free from outside forces enough, not totally, but enough to make a decision. Otherwise, we would not be able to even talk about people being able to be, uh, have a conversion experience. So I, I, I think what you're saying is very good. And I, I tend, you know, I, all of my books are about, well, are about worldview and how important your ideas are to how you live, uh, the choices you make. So I, I'm, yes, I'm totally with you. If you, I like the way you put it. Um, one of my friends who's a chief of staff on Capitol Hill loves that phrase, politics is downstream from culture. Because working on Capitol Hill, he sees a lot of people, including Christians who work on Capitol Hill, who are totally absorbed by politics. And his point is that, no, culture really determines politics more than the other way around. Um, but your point is well taken. What determines culture then? <laughs> I do think it's ultimately, you know, uh, an interaction between you and God in your deepest personal being. So I appreciate your bringing that to uh, bringing that balance here. Yeah, absolutely. I, it's it's interesting that you mentioned Marxism, and there's there's a lot of talk of that going on right now in politics, and um, and it's very subversive in the way things have. But now it's becoming more apparent that 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 is what is going on. And uh, you, you just see people becoming absorbed in that, and but then they absorb that worldview, uh, like you were saying, and it starts from everything is just deterministic from if your economic status is bad, then you're going this direction. If your economic status is good, then you're in this camp, and, and these two sides should fight against each other. And trying to, to reshape a narrative within our society that, that says this is the way it is, and um, I think it's why books such as Total Truth are so important for people to engage their minds and actually think, is this really the way that the world works or is this something that's a lie trying to sneak itself in as as truth? Because even the idea today where people will say there is no such thing as absolute truth, and but that's an absolute statement. And they, there's always a way, they say it, but it's never to eliminate truth, it's to eliminate your ability to argue against anything they're about to do as this is the absolute, this is what you must do, this is the right thing, this is the wrong thing. It, there's always just this overwhelming um, spirit, I guess you could say, behind it of control, power, authority, do dominion. Um, and so I think we see that in our in our culture right now. What So what would you say um, to the person who's listening, uh, who may have started out in like a faith-based family, like you, you said you did, uh, but now is identifying as an atheist or a, an agnostic, what would be the first thing you would start to engage them with? Well, of course, you would ask them first what happened. Um, there are people who become estranged from the church for emotional reasons, and you know, somebody hurt them, somebody hurt their feelings, somebody was, um, was mean to them, <laughs> I mean, literally. Uh, and I would say um, th th that... That is 
somewhat common, but there was a recent um, a survey done that found out that that's not as common as you would think. These researchers found out that the majority of, they, they interviewed former Christians and asked, okay, so why did you leave the church? And interestingly enough, the vast majority referred to intellectual questions. They were referred to questions about uh, secular philosophies that they had learned. They referred to questions about science and hasn't science disproved the Bible? They, they referred to doubt, doubts and questions that were not answered. They brought their doubts and questions to the church leadership, um, and the church leadership did not know how to answer them. Um, one guy actually wrote a book about it, you know, how he left the Christian faith. And he said, my, my youth group leaders were nice guys. And so he said, they, were, they were nice guys, but they were not the brightest bulb <laughs> in the lamp, is how he put it. And he said, when I started asking questions, they had no answers. And that's how he left Christianity behind. So, so uh, it seems that my experience is more common than most people realize. And the, the researchers themselves were surprised. They just assumed that there would be relational issues. You know, somebody was unkind to them. Somebody didn't understand them. Somebody didn't, you know, connect relationally with them. They just assumed that would be the answer, and it was not. So they would, the researchers themselves were surprised. So what I appreciated about Labrie was that it, dealt with both levels. So on the one hand, um, Labrie uh, dealt with, this is again, Francis Schaeffer's ministry in Switzerland. Um, it was the first time I had experienced apologetics. So that was a big deal, you know, because you do have to treat people's questions seriously. If they do have questions, I kept running into people who said, you know, there's something wrong with you if you don't have faith. You know, like it's a moral failing not to have faith. Instead of dealing with my questions, honestly, Schaefer was known for saying, we need to give honest answers to honest questions. And when I tell Christians that, sometimes they come back with, well, you know, questions aren't honest. You know, they're just rebelling against God. No, God made every person with a mind, with reason, with rationality, and they do have questions that need to be answered rationally. Now, I'm not saying that's the only thing. <laughs> But you have to treat the mind with respect. God made us with minds. I really appreciated that at Labrie was the first time I ran into Christians who didn't just push me aside and say, something's wrong with you. You know, do you really have a moral problem? I run into it now sometimes. I tell people my story and they say, yeah, you just wanted to party more on, on the weekends, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's not true. And uh, uh, Labrie was the first place where I got treated seriously with my questions. So that, I think that is an important first step. The second step is to find out whether they do, in fact, have some emotional issues. And at Labrie, there was a, on staff, was a psychiatric social worker. And she, was, she agreed to be on staff because she realized that there are a lot of people who do have emotional issues as well that can stand between them and uh, becoming a Christian, especially uh, pastor's kids and missionary kids. Yeah. She she herself was a missionary kid. So she understood. Uh, and she had gone through a, a long period of not being a Christian before she came back. And um, I um, I went to see her when she, uh, when I was at Labrie because I had a I, ha I had a home life where my dad was severely abusive, physically abusive. And I've only started recently to talk about it publicly. Just so you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, you know, as long as he was alive, I never said a thing. Mm. Uh, but he died a few years ago, and I'm, I'm, <laughs> and I'm starting to tear up a little bit <laughs> just talking about it because he, it was very severe. And so th I did have an emotional reason. I, I didn't think so at the time. <laughs> I thought it was just intellectual. But as I began to get my intellectual questions answered, you know, with sort of layers and layers, um, as those layers got peeled off, I began to realize, well, I also didn't want Christianity to be true because I did not want to be anything like my parents. Yeah. I wanted to be as far away from my parents as possible. I wanted to, you know, if they were Christians, I didn't want to be one. So I had to work through both sides. And I would say this is probably true with most people is you, you treat their minds with respect and, and then you ask, then you ask, you know, are there any other reasons? Is there any, are there any emotional motivations that could also be behind it? And, um, and, and then you get into, you know, well, I read dozens and dozens of books on emotional healing, psychological healing, and so on. Uh, when I was first a Christian to, to deal with these issues, I read lots of books on the problem of suffering because I thought, you know, why did God let this happen? So, uh, 
so I, I would say that when you're talking to a person, you have to treat them as a whole person mm -hmm. and deal with all, all, all levels of possible objections to Christianity. I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. I know we really enjoyed interviewing Nancy. And I think if you guys enjoyed this one, you will probably enjoy the second one even more. Uh, Not next, just probably, absolutely. Absolutely, because absolute truth, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you will Total absolutely truth. enjoy the next one more. So next week, please tune in. Join us for uh, our interview as we cover Love Thy Body, Nancy Piercy's most recent book. 